Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me. Uh, I make a point to always take an invitation if it is sponsored by a university, an academic institution, um, because I feel like before students go off to become practitioners, there is perhaps a small window where they can become warmer and more amenable to the kind of work that I do. So I try to take that opportunity to influence them however I can. So fraud, it is the one constant, not just in capital markets, but in humanity. Um, as, as much as we as people want to believe in our fellow man and rely upon them, there's always going to be that shady, nefarious character um, who's looking to take advantage of that goodwill. Um, and that is true for capital markets. Investors, especially when we're in a boom cycle, as we've had for the last 15 years, where there is such a tremendous amount of liquidity, um, investors are just naturally doing less and less due diligence because there is simply too much money and too few places to allocate it to. So you kind of just throw a dart and, you know, whatever hits is okay. Um, and what this ends up, ha what, what happens then is that in these periods um, of economic prosperity, um, investors may overlook certain things they perhaps wouldn't. Um, things that they would normally question in a in less of a boom or less of a, a bullish market. Um, so investors oftentimes do not want to find fraud because they're simply not looking for it. It doesn't fit in with their investment objectives. Um, and then we have the regulators. Regulators, I, I, to steal a term from my colleague Jim Chanos, he refers to them as the financial archaeologists. So they are looking at fraud post-mortem, after it all happens, um, because regulators never want to stand in the way of economic prosperity. They don't want to see, be seen as the ones that catalyze a bull market ending. Um, so it's not in their best interest to go out and find, investigate, and prosecute fraud. Um, you know, especially over these last 15 years. So who is out there? Um, who is out there that's trying to take advantage of the markets and who's out there trying to stop it? Um, so one thing that, that Jim Chanos also says, he, he's, he's called this period of liquidity post-COVID the golden age of fraud. And I mostly agree with that. Um, but I take issue with the idea that there's perhaps more fraud now than there's ever been. Um, because I believe fraud is generally a constant. What matters are all of these other factors. Is there opportunity and incentive? So yes, post-COVID and since the financial crisis, there's definitely been opportunity and incentive. And a lot of that has been driven by private markets and the amount of liquidity before these companies even get publicly traded. Um, private equity firms, venture capital, uh, they're investing in technologies that may not exist. They're investing in ideas where there is limited evidence. And what is the objective of these private company investors? It is ultimately to exit to the public markets. So for the last 15 years, public markets have been the greater fool. Um, so it isn't as though these companies wouldn't have existed in any other situation. It's just that they've become so massive and so inflated because of the amount of capital that went in with limited amounts of due diligence. Um, those companies have really capitalized on our willingness as people to believe in things that do not yet exist. So who's going to stop it? Um, of course, you would think that the first line of defense that we have against fraud in the capital markets would be whistleblowers within a company. They are the ones that see it. They are the ones that are party to it. Um, they might even be helping commit it. Uh, but the other thing about whistleblowers is that they have everything to lose by actually coming out and exposing the fraud. They are going to have 
extreme reputational damage. They will most definitely be blacklisted from working within that industry. They will be litigated to death by their former employer, even if that employer might be guilty of fraud. They still will likely, in bankruptcy, be suing that employee for breaking their employment contracts. And it gets even worse. I mean, these companies can go out of their way to harass, to intimidate. There was a case a few years ago of a company that I was short where one of those whistleblowers actually committed suicide. Um, so there is a real moral danger, a mortal danger, um, for these whistleblowers. So it's not often that you can expect um, a whistleblower to come forward and save us all from fraud. Um, and, and I would also add <laughs> that oftentimes, whistleblowers are very imperfect characters. Um, the whistleblowers that we've interacted with, for example, in the Wirecard case, were guys that you would never want to be meeting in a private location. Uh, you, you want to make sure that you, you have GPS tracking, you've got you know, someone hiding in the bushes, keeping an eye on you. Uh, these are likely people who are committing the same crimes and engage in the same kind of fraudulent activity that you're trying to expose. And then the auditors. Uh, the th to be fair to auditors, I would say most of the time they do catch fraud. Um, I think we, we focus on the times that they don't because those are the stories that make headlines and make the, the textbooks, but most of the time auditors do find financial discrepancies. I mean, it is their job, but what it's not it, it isn't their job to then actually go deeper and see, are the documents, for example, that are presented to me, are these actually authentic? These are not the, the normal questions that get asked during a typical standard annual audit. You're being paid by the, the customer that you are basically in charge of auditing, and oftentimes most auditing firms will leave their most junior employees doing the grunt work, and they simply don't know what to look for. So most of the time when there is a case where fraud gets overlooked by auditors, it's usually simply because of auditor incompetence, not necessarily maliciousness. Um, of course, the, you know, there are situations where you, want, you question you know, the coziness, the relationship between audit partners and the company itself, but it's, rarely the, it's very rarely the case. Um, so many times as short sellers, we'll try to see actually if the audit firm is amenable to meeting with us, to discussing our, our information, to taking their information and perhaps investigating it further. Um, so you know, that's sort of an easier path forward um, than usual for some of these shorts. But <clears throat> when those two layers of defense fail us, you're left with people like me, <laughs> market participants, um, but also journalists. And in, in our case, um, there is positive incentive, and then there is, you know, a, 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 we're incentivized positively um, to actually expose fraud. So journalists, they're of course incentivized by the reputational gain they can make if they break a story. I mean, Dan McCrum, no one's ever going to forget him now after his expose of Wirecard. And short sellers, well, I mean, we make money. It's pretty simple. Uh, so I will leave it with that, and we can have some questions. Thank, thank you very much, Fami. Um, so I suggest we proceed uh, in two steps. First, I ask a few questions, and then uh, we open the, the, the room for, for questions. So um, my first question to you, Fami, is uh, your view on the role of narratives in financial markets. Because oftentimes we see those narratives about certain investment ideas being, you know, getting momentum and being accepted by the a lot and lot of market participants. And suddenly you have shifts. So how do you how do you view that? Ultimately markets are, are people driven and people are driven by stories. Um, and investments are usually allocated on the basis of, you know, who's telling me the most compelling story. Um, so what oftentimes, you know, as I was discussing before, when in this period of extreme prosperity and lots of liquidity, almost bottomless liquidity, uh, you have businesses that are telling you an almost religious story in that 
it's not something that is ever going to be tangible. It's not something that uh, you can ever measure. Um, you can't see it in a financial statement, but it's a story that draws you in, plays on your emotion, your, your willingness to believe in something being solved. Uh, and that's the language that they use. Um, and, and the job of a short seller is to take that narrative and turn it on its head, to find the weaknesses, find the vulnerabilities, and then tell an even more compelling story. Um, so as short sellers, we have to consider what bits of information that can, can we compile about a company and who can we package that information for such that they will be more attracted to the story that I am telling them versus the one that the company tells them. So that is going to be a very different story for journalists, for example they are going to be interested in certain bits of information, but it's also going to be different than the story we might go to, to a securities regulator or you know, any kind of enforcement authority um, because they're going to be more concerned not just about what grabs headlines, but you know, what information do we have that, they could, that could be used to prosecute a case. So on both sides, it's ultimately about storytelling. So you always need to understand who is the audience, what are they motivated, buy and how can I change their mind? Some of the easiest shorts that I've ever had, the ones where I don't really have to lift a finger, it comes, it's, you find businesses that are broken down, maybe, maybe growing obsolete, they might be structurally broken, and then you look at the list of holders, and I guarantee you will find in that top 50 list of holders, investors who have been holding that company for 10 plus years. Are those investors looking to increase their allocation to this company? No. They are usually looking for a reason to sell. So the easiest way to make money, which and we need to find those easy ways, would be just to go to those investors, understand what story they need to hear to convince them to sell. Thank you, super, super interesting. So. A follow-up question, you sort of uh, already gave elements, but um, if I understand correctly, SAFCAT is not a, an activist short-selling organization per se, but you're not that far. You certainly have all the capacity to find um, the uh, critical evidence. What's your rationale behind? You think it's more effective to go and, and communicate with certain market participants differently than being upfront and say, okay, publicly, we have this short, this is the reason why. Yeah, I, I think it's more just of a, a semantics issue. I think you know the public lexicon uses activist short seller as that meaning the, the guys who are publishing research reports, and that is something that I will never do. Um, but we are definitely activists in the more traditional sense in that we are taking our, our research, our, our evidence, and making sure the outcomes are matching our expectations with that thesis. Um, so what this would mean is that you know, we have to be strategic about you know, what is the thesis, what information do we have, who does it matter to, and of those people, who can actually affect outcomes. Um, so, so that's the way we go about it. I personally don't view myself as the most effective storyteller of a company's fraud, because obviously I am incredibly biased. I have a huge financial interest in my story being the right story. Um, so I don't find myself being in a credible position um, to tell the right story. But that isn't to say that I don't agree with activist short selling. I think that's great. Um, but I want to be in this business for the long run, um, and I don't want to face the risks that come with um, publishing research, um, because when, once you start publishing research, you start getting sued and litigated. So you know that's the first risk. So try raising money on that basis. It's very difficult, and it's already a difficult business to raise money in anyway. Um, so no one wants that kind of litigation hurdle. Um, but then on top of that, uh, you start losing access to these businesses. 
So as of now, I can still walk into a conference. I can still meet with management. Yeah, they know I'm a short seller, but they know that I'm not going to go take this and then publish it you know, on a blog or on Twitter or something. Uh, they know that I can come into a room, I can have a discussion, and I will process that information. So I still am able to, to this day, maintain access. And I think that's still a, you know, a valuable resource that I can draw, draw on as I continue my work. And the same goes for authority. I don't go you know, cry wolf to the SEC every time I'm short a company. I have to respect that they have limited resources, so I only go to regulators when I have something they can actually do something about. And when I go to them, they know they should take me seriously because I don't use that lever very often. Thank you. Um, so I don't want to steal the guest, so I think we can open the, the questions from the audience. Uh, so I will share the, the mic. We have, I, I have one, one question up there, one question down there. Okay, let me, so I don't want to be the judge of who's getting to talk, so I'll give the, the all to Sonia <laughs> and Iris. <laughs> I have a quick question. Where do you draw the line or how you handle like non-public information? Because I believe, well, is the main of it. It is a 10 foot long, 10 foot wide black line. I, as a fiduciary, as someone who wants to be actively trading the things that I'm short, I need to make sure that I am nowhere near anything that is material non-public information. My sister, she's a securities lawyer, so she, since I was a child, has really whipped me into the mindset of you never want to be in a position where you even have to write a memo saying, I may have come into contact with something that is, I can't trade on. So we just avoid them. And, and this is hard because on a regular basis, we get emails from whistleblowers, but those whistleblowers might be employees within a company. I can't do anything with that information. But what I can do is maybe provide some assistance to the whistleblower, recommend a lawyer to them so that they can go and get the help they need. But I personally can't do anything to financially benefit from that kind of a trade. Um, so yeah, I, I have to be super, super careful. That is just something, um, whenever you're doing work that involves whistleblowers, involves human sources, you just have to be meticulous with your notes, uh, with your record keeping. You have to have a. You have to be super cautious um, about who you speak to, what, what questions you ask, and whenever you speak to someone, you always have to say, "I'm coming into this. It's on the record. I do not want any material non-public information." So it is always top of mind. You have to be obsessively on top of it, um, and that's why you know to this day I have not been sued and. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I have one question. Could you please um, share with us um, more details about your screening process? Do you have a quantitative criteria uh, and also for the quanti qualitative criteria? And also, um, how do you find uh, whistleblowers? Yeah, so. When we were first launching the fund, we relied more on sort of that inorganic process of screening for securities. Um, but I would say, to, at, you know, currently, the only kind of screen that we use, superficial screen, is really just making sure that the businesses are liquid, so trading at least $10 million a day, um, so we can get in and out if we need to, um, and they're sufficiently large enough. So as close, you know, a billion plus is our ideal spot as far as market cap. Uh, and then it's a more qualitative process. Uh, so there are certain kinds of businesses that we tend to gravitate towards. Um, we like businesses and industries that have very gray regulatory environments. Um, so a lot of what we have shorted since the inception of the fund has been in the consumer finance space um, because at least in the United States, every state has a different set of rules around consumer loans. Um, and then you also have federal 
uh, laws around it. Uh, so you oftentimes find these businesses that it's a very tough business anyway, as far as margins, um, but they try to really stretch what is legal and what's ethical. Um, and it's, you know, it's often a ripe target. Um, we like to tar also target businesses that are very complex. So multinationals that have subsidiaries all over the map, um, because that gives us a lot more information with which to work. Um, because if a company has uh, subsidiaries in Singapore, for example, we can go and get the private company financials for those subsidiaries. And it's again, it's just another data point. I would say the richest source of ideas, though, has been failed short campaigns. So looking at targets uh, of short sellers and journalists over the last 10 years, under, because I believe that when you have that kind of history of allegations against a company, it's usually coming from somewhere. Um, so oftentimes it might just require a fresh pair of eyes, a change to the story that might be enough to give us a real opportunity to be right on the thing. Um, and I would say since the inception of the fund, that's been the most fruitful source of ideas. Valiant was a case like that. It was you know, a, a history of failed shorts. Um, same thing with Wirecard. Do you, need a, do you need a catalyst? Since you are not public about your position, maybe you need a cat catalyst? Yeah, so we're always very sensitive to timing because my portfolio is chunky. Uh, we tend to take very large positions in a few number of issuers. Um, so for that reason, we need to be pretty certain about timing of, of our opportunities. And we can never know, you know a drop dead date, uh, but we, we like to at least narrow the confidence window around those dates um, the, the best we can. And the, and the way that we do that is simply just really doing the work. Um, once you really understand uh, the story, you understand how the management, how the board is going to react to certain bits of information, you can make uh, a judgment call on how big you should be and when. Uh, but the critical piece is when you size up your short. And in order to really capitalize on those situations where the catalyst happens, is we don't just take our money and run. We press and we press and we press. And then we take our money and run. Thank you. Hi. I will... <clears throat> Sorry. So you were saying something about the timing. And I have to say that the timing of this conference is really amazing because just two days ago, your colleagues from Hindenburg Research published, published a major paper um, about Adani Group. And I, <clears throat> and I want to ask you two questions about um, this investigation. And um, so what is particular about the Adani Group is that um, we learned that um, enforcement agencies, authorities in India, and the government as well, they are basically stalling every litigation um, concerning Adani Group. And what is particular about it, this group is also that the majority of shares are held by the insiders. So basically the free flow is very low. It's around 25%. <clears throat> so my two questions are as, well, my one question um, concerns these two points. So from investor standpoint, is this a great opportunity for you? Because I mean, some, some, somehow I think short sellers rely on, on governments and on enforcement agencies to basically investigate th this target and it will drive the price down. And also I think the less there is free flow, the harder it is to to actually, well, at some, we can say manipulate the price. So what do you think about that? Um, so just uh, some more background on, on Indian securities in general. Uh, Indian stock exchanges, there is no short selling. So on, on equities, on publicly traded equities, there's no short sell. Uh, so the issue of float matters less. I think Hindenburg is said that they're short the bonds. Um, and a lot of those are US traded. Uh, so you don't have the, the liquidity issue as much. And I think it's a, a safer way to make the trade. Um, so I won't comment on Anani specifically, but on, on the Indian market more generally. Uh, I think you know, India is going through a massive period of growth right now. Um, and there's 
a crazy amount of, of money that's being injected into the economy and also wealth that's being made, and that there's gonna undoubtedly be growing pains. Um, and SEBI, the securities regulator there, is already starting to look, you know, take a look at its disclosures, its transparency, the process by which companies are coming public um, because uh, the poor performance of IPOs over the past year or two in India has actually prompted a lot of concern that you know, maybe there, we have a problem here. Um, and the other thing about the Indian market is largely just retail investors. You don't really have institutional money. Um, so there's a lot more you know, for the average person um, they have to lose. Though the average person, we're, we're talking about a very small percentage of India's population that's actually invested in the stock market. Uh, so I think it's very interesting to see how this all develops. Um, I'm an advocate for more transparent capital markets everywhere. Um, and I, I would hope that as India is attracting more foreign capital, um, they'll take a look at capital markets and see how they can um, maybe introduce more sophistication. Um, but I think that'll require you having institutional capital in India, including you know, hedge funds, mutual funds, um, not just sort of niche ones, but ones that are more actively investing in the space there. I think that'll all create more pressure on, on the securities regulator to up their game. Uh, but I would say that corruption is everywhere, right? You know, it's not just in India. I mean, India is an easy target, but you know, in the, in the US, you also have cases where um, certain investigations might be dampened by the fact the, uh, the companies have a very good lawyer who used to work in the Southern District of New York. So it happens everywhere. Um, but as a short seller, I advocate for better markets everywhere, um, even in the markets where I might not really have an opportunity to make money just yet. So hello again. Uh, I've got a question for you. Um, how do you short uh, practically? Do you use CFD? Do you um, borrow stocks and sell it? Do you use CDS? And how do you make sure that you control the communication? Because I think, well, I, may be, I may be wrong, that you have to disclose your position uh, each quarter uh, as, a, as a hedge fund in the United States. So how do you control the communication uh, regarding your portfolio? Uh, so this is an interesting uh, question because I've actually been doing a lot of work on the regulatory side over the past couple of years to uh, make sure that new regulations as far as disclosure of shorts is not introduced in the US and so far have, have been successful in that. Uh, the way that public for investment advisor reporting works in the US is that long positions get disclosed in the 13Fs, not shorts. Unless, of course, you have a puts at a certain level. So if you buy, you're buying puts or if you have, now they're introducing disclosure around structured products after the blow up of Archegos last year. Um, so, so that's the issue. So if you avoid too, having too many puts, if you ha avoid having structured products, you won't have to have disclosure of your shorts. And this is why we largely focus on very liquid and large equities and credit. Um, so it's mostly we have cash positions uh, for the most part. Yes, yeah, so, so we borrow, the, but we have to, by law, we have to borrow the securities and then um, we'll, we'll sell them. Um, but it's, it's mostly done in cash um, so that, you know, it's just easier to manage. We don't get stuck in a position um, that, and we can, you know, trade it around as we need to. Um, you never know for sure I, you know, what, what brokers will tell uh, their other clients. Uh, so you just need to develop relationships that are with brokers you trust. And that's, that's really all you can do. You can't prevent every little leak. Um, but I've really made it a point since I started doing this of cultivating a small circle of trust um, of people who really believe in what I'm doing no matter what role they play in, in my life, just for this exact reason, so they don't somehow screw me over down the line. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is an issue of brokers potentially doing stuff like that or trading your positions, but you know, it, it's fine. Um, these are all things you have to just deal with you know, as a 
in the course of doing business, basically. Sorry, me, me again. Uh, can you be influenced by macroeconomics? For example, now we have increasing interest rates, companies struggling with uh, increasing energy prices. So can it be a, a, an opportunity for you? Or you necessarily need uh, a fraud? I, I'm, I'm not a macro trader, uh, so I will never trade exclusively on macro factors. But we, of course, take every bit of macro data um, into consideration as part of our very idiosyncratic thesis on a particular security. Um, so, for example, if, if this is a business that won't do well in a rising rate environment, uh, then that gives us a better opportunity to short it. So the macroeconomic factor really just helps us with our timing and our opportunity. Um, it sort of gives us like an implicit kind of catalyst uh, to make money on those trades, but it's not ever a direct um, piece of uh, portfolio management. Thank you. I would like to um, I would like to to get your opinion about uh, Wall Street bets, and more precisely about uh, what happened with GameStop, about the battle between um, um, the Wall Street bet users and um, hedge funds, including Melvin Capital, and um, sub-related short question is, um, do you think that this could happen again from Wall Street Bets with another stock? Well, Wall Street Bets is just the same thing we always see at the very end of every market cycle. It is, you know, before I was saying how the public markets have served to be the greater fool for private investors, well, retail investors serve to be the greater fool for institutional capital in public markets. Um, so, you know, at, at the point at which there's so much money and you see your neighbor, you know, with their Lamborghini that they got from trading crypto, it seduces everyone. So everyone gets swept up into the, the idea that there's money to be made in the market by stock picking um, and, and day trading. And whether we had Reddit now, before it was, you know, GeoCities and Yahoo message boards, there's always been a forum, um, a way for retail investors to get um, lulled into to the stock market at the very worst possible time. Um, so this is nothing new. I mean, it all, you know, technological advances have, have maybe changed the way it all looks and how it plays out, but it's the same thing that happens with, with every market cycle. And a lot of retail investors end up losing a lot of money. I think some of this has gotten worsed, worsened, exacerbated in the current market cycle, not so much because we have things like Wall Street bets, but it's more because of a, a market structure uh, kind of question. Uh, again, it's not something I know too much about, but it's just the rise of options trading, um, especially short-term options, you know, zero or one day till expiry options, this kind of, these kind of instruments really serve as a fuel for pure speculation in the markets um, that retail investors inevitably get sucked into. Uh, so I think when we think about these, these retail investors who are losing their money on things like GameStop, I don't know if it's a question of, you know, should we stop retail investing? It's more of understanding the instruments that are in the market. Are these safe instruments? Um, how are they affecting market structure? Um, and, and, you know, should they be changed in any way or regulated in any way? Um, but, yeah, you know, retail investor w will always exist. Um, I personally was not involved in any of the meme stocks because we try to avoid companies where it's very obvious a short squeeze is coming. And things like GameStop, I mean, it's very high short interest. Um, you know, when we're taking a, that meaningful of a position in our portfolio, a, a position that could basically turn the lights off, as it was for some funds on their GameStop short, you know, for us it means we think someone's going to jail, you know, not because we think something is gonna go bankrupt. Um, because hopefully in those situations where something is gonna go bankrupt, we were shorted for you know, the months and the years leading up to it. Um, so we don't need to really withstand that kind of volatility that comes around uh, with being like you know, just a stub on the debt. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what was your biggest mistake and why it went wrong? 
Um, so my biggest mistake was actually my biggest lesson learned, and it was early in my career. Um, I was uh, being asked to look at a company that a lot of my peers, my fellow short sellers, thought I should investigate that I should be short because it was a healthcare company. And my initial expertise was in healthcare. Um, and every day, I was getting multiple calls a day from multiple short sellers asking me, you know, have I looked at this company? They were, they'd throw all of these, you know, amazing tidbits about what the company was doing, you know, how it was basically, it, it, the product itself um, was like a, a laser machine for, for health purposes. So, you know, it sounds like something that would be a fraud. It, you know, you plug it into a wall and it'll make you prettier, happier, um, it'll improve every aspect of your life, that, that kind of thing. So anyway, the company would basically go to the medical spas um, where those spas had its competitor's product and the company would then take the competitor's product, replace it with their own product. So they were basically just going around and doing this and collecting you know, this inventory of their competitor's products. Anyway, all sounds like great fodder for a short, but the thing was, this was still in the period of a lot of M&A in healthcare, uh, and the company was not ludicrously expensive. I mean, it was two billion uh, with zero debt. So in my mind, I was always just on this fence because I knew that someone, you know, there are multiple offenders here who have a ton of money, nothing to do with it, who would easily just jump into this, buy it, you know, even if it is a massive fraud. But <laughs> the peer pressure got too extreme. Um, I felt like I, you know, people were getting mad at me because I wasn't shorting this thing. I didn't want them to think that, you know, I was too good for it. So I shorted it. Um, I shorted it, I, you know, I sized it thinking, you know, it still might get it taken out. Two weeks later, it got bought out at a, you know, like a 20% premium, um, and then a quarter later, or, or well, maybe it was a year later, the company that acquired it wrote the entire acquisition off. Um, so yeah, the, the short sellers were right, but they all lost their money, and myself included. So that was really a lesson in that even though short sellers are outsiders, we can also be an echo chamber. So. For me, I, I needed to make sure I can always step away from that as well. Uh, have you ever avoided to take a position because of menace you can receive from investor or from the company directly? Uh, no, I, I don't think I would ever uh, have entered this business if I had a normal human sense of risk. Um, I have a very perverse relationship with risk. That's how I can survive in this business. So for me, you know, when a company is gonna make threats, um, I think that just motivates me more. Uh, but what I do have is a very strong support network. Um, so, you know, family, friends, my analysts, they all look out for me, they have my back. So even if I don't see, you know, the guy stalking me or, or whatever, they, they, they know and they're looking out for me. So um, I'm still free to do what I do, um, but yeah, it, that shouldn't be the case, right? You know, if you think about it, like it's, it's absolutely crazy, egregiously crazy that someone who's just an investor, a market participant, could receive threats and be litigated against just for doing their job. Um, but, you know, that's, say la vie, I guess. It's, these, these companies have basically been, it's cheaper for them to, do, to harass me than it is for me to, you know, expose them. That, that's the calculation. Um, so, you know, they can spend a million dollars on lawyers and make me disappear or, or whatever it might be, but they lose everything if I am able to continue to do my work undeterred. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to know that uh, as we came to know that uh, you, start, you are from a, uh, mathematics and biology background, how the journey began into finance? 
<laughs> so this is, it's serendipity, accident, who knows, right? This was never planned. I never wanted to work in finance. In fact, I was one of those people who sort of looked down at finance, so sorry everyone, uh, because I was just raised as someone like, who's a very liberal thinker. I was very bohemian, very progressive. Uh, my, my obsession was math, that was my first love. Uh, but that same passion, those values that I was raised with, that I've nurtured my entire life, I found a home within finance that is totally aligned with those views. Um, I'm basically able to take those views and use it as motivation and ultimately a way for me to make money. But how did I end up here? Um, so it's, it's really funny uh, because when I was 14 years old, I got a grant from Jim Simons, the founder of Renaissance Technology, uh, to do research in biophysics. Uh, I had no idea about him as a hedge fund manager. I mean, I had fam family in finance and, and who were quants and stuff, so I knew he founded a hedge fund, but I only knew him as this guy who was giving me money to do this work in a lab. Uh, and then, uh, let's, what, not even 10 years later, I found myself at the Museum of Mathematics in New York. Um, it was just being built. A lot of my professors were involved in that, so I got involved. And who was funding the Museum of Mathematics? It was Jim Simons, uh, the same guy. <laughs> so uh, at that point in my life, I was a lot more open. I, I grew up, so I was a lot more open to different ways of doing things, different ways of sort of enacting uh, the changes that I want to see. Uh, so, it was at the Museum of Mathematics. They said, you know, Fami, have you ever thought about this hedge fund thing? You know, let's put, us, let's put you in touch with some people. And that's how it all started. And now I can't imagine doing any, anything else. Thank you. So, we may have time for one last question. Uh, I, I saw two hands uh, rose at the same time, so I don't know what to do here and over there. The thing is, over there, it's closer, closer to the mic, <laughs> so, so, so I'm sorry, but you can uh, maybe chat after. Hi, Femi. I have a question for you and Luke, because uh, in academic paper, I'm an academia, and in academic paper, we know that a uh, short seller's target firm with poor earning quality. So in practice, how do you find that a firm is with poor earning quality? Yeah, uh, so I, if you like academic papers, you should read my letter to Boffin that I wrote uh -huh. in defense of the short selling ban, uh, because I cite a lot of these academic papers around short selling there. Um, but yeah, on this issue, I would say that because short sellers are specifically looking to identify securities where the price, the market is inefficient, so we believe the price will go down, what is the main reason they do that? Poor earnings quality. So if we, if we are, it, through our analysis of the financial statements, if there are weaknesses there, if there's an over-reliance, for example, in, uh, example on adjusted earnings, um, various non-GAAP metrics, then that's something that we're much more likely to short. So if you look in the grand scheme of thing at all of these data points of where there's high short interest, what you will find is that usually this, in the subsequent quarters, those companies will usually miss their earnings. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Fami, uh, very much for your, uh, for your insights, for taking the time to come here and talk with us. Uh, let's, let's congratulate Fami. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. You.